Hi, Jennifer. Hi. You? I'm doing great. How are you? Fabulous. So where are you? Where are you in this photograph on the planet? This photograph was taken where I was out in front of, um, I think, the Cayman Islands. The Cayman Islands. That is a nice room for a boat. Um, I'm at the end of Via Benedo in Roma. That's actually the CIA uh, safe house. I don't think it's a headquarters, but it's got all that stuff over it, right underneath my family name. That's awesome. Martini. Martini. Allora, I thought that we would just do today's interview completely in Italian. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> we did do that. We have done that. That's I'm sure amazing. We have. Sure we have. Yeah. I know. You did a little bit, but then I get in my head, though, because I want to get things right. So I get in my head. It's fun. It's a fun place to go. Or as Luana said, my head's like an aircraft carrier or an aircraft hangar. Empty. That's um, speaking of Luana, I do want to mention this is the end of our Luana raffle. So yes. Friday night, I'm going to cut up all the names and put them in a hat and have our cat choose a name or somebody. <laughs> and yeah. um, awesome. So just to remind people, you have until Friday night to purchase a copy of Backstage Pass, the flip side, one, two, or three. Send a confirmation to Martini Prods, P R O D S, at Gmail, and you're entered into a raffle to spend an hour with Jennifer talking to whoever you want to talk to. Um, and then there's the Luana part of the equation, which is there's five questions that I posted on richmartini.com, my webpage, richmartini.com. If you get one of those questions right, there are five questions that only Luana would know the answer to. If you get one of them right, you get a free copy of the book. So good. So weird and kind of fun. And we, you know, we've got a few entries. So but this is the thing we want people to know that this is accessible to everyone. Everyone can talk to their loved ones. Everyone can talk to who they want to up there, you know, and you ask for signs and it's amazing if, when people get out of their head, what they can do, what they're capable of. Yeah, it's so true. But, you know, we've talked about this. Grief is so, such an overwhelming emotion. So when you lose somebody, you know, you're so caught up in that emotion of the grief. And we've talked to your dad about it, your dad on the flip side, and, and he gave us great advice. I always bears repeating, but I had asked him that question, how do we help people with grief? And he had said, have them move grief to nostalgia. And we asked him what that meant because neither one of us knew. And he said, grief is only sad emotions. Nostalgia contains both happy and sad emotions. And when you can move grief to nostalgia, you begin to heal. Um, a Facebook friend of mine, a film director, posted a really lovely memory of another film director who passed away recently, a young woman. I didn't know her, but wow, you know, what a devastating thing for so many close friends, because she was the light of their lives. But oh, the one, the one from Little, um, Little Fires. Yes, Little I, don't, I don't know her yes. name, I'm sorry to say. Uh, and I don't want to, we aren't, Jennifer and I aren't here to invade people's grief, you know, and if we started chatting with her or neither one of us knew her, I don't think that would be fair to her loved ones. I don't think so either, but I just wanted to tell you what I did. I did read it. I was, because I loved the show. It was very, you know, I love watching Reese Witherspoon in it. And it's a great, you know, if anybody's read the book, Little Fires Everywhere, it's just, it's really, really just a great it's a great book that tackles so many different aspects of human culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was fascinated by what she put on screen. And when I was, I mean, everyone adored her. She was just that good of a person. Everyone had the most amazing things to say about her. It was very- and, Well, in, in this Kimberly Pierce, film director, Boys Don't Cry, she wrote this wonderful, eulogy for her 
how close they were as friends. And then she went by her house and she put some flowers out. And then there was a moment where I think a hummingbird flew by. And the, some woman she was standing with said, well, that was her, you know, sending a message. And I wrote a post talking about that, which is something you and I've heard many, many times where people orchestrate some kind of a sign to help their loved ones realize they aren't gone. They haven't left. They're well, still accessible. What I found interesting, I asked my dad earlier this morning, I'm like, Dad, give me a sign that you're around. And he put you in my head. And he, and I'm like, what? Rich Martini? And he's like, yeah, he'll say something about me at the beginning of the show, which you did. And that's why I was laughing. Jim, right. I appreciate that. Well, you did mention it last week. I know you don't remember what we talk about, but you did mention it. You had asked some kind of a sign and when the yeah. pandemic was opening up you went down to the beach and found a sand dollar mm -hmm. um yeah, is it around nice is it around you you don't have it do you no you i don't know. it's at home okay sorry but I, it just shows we don't plan in advance but no. the point is how do you get a sign so let's just talk about that a little bit let's help people so i'm going to ask luana our friend on the flip side, who is in charge of our class, you guys all know, she's the one that the book is named after backstage past the flip side because Tom Petty of all people said she's like the person at the VIP lounge behind a velvet rope with a clipboard. Yeah. And if you don't get through her, you don't get to talk to us. But if you do, we're here to chat with you. But Lou, let's ask you, or if somebody wants to come forward and chat with us, it's up to you. you're in charge of this class, but how do people project a sign from over there to their loved one here? The first thing that she says is they need to be patient. It's not something that it takes a lot. Hold on. She says it takes a lot for us to do this without being physically here you know, but on the planet, right on the planet. But she says, well, she says that we're on the planet, but going back and forth. Um, and that also doesn't mean that they're stuck here, you know, because some people are like, are my keeping them from being somewhere? No, they're here to help us. Right. Uh, but whatever, you know, ask them for a sign and see what pops into your head. You know, because a lot of times they give us the sign that they're going to orchestrate for us later. Right. And when you get the sign, this is what I recommend. We've talked about this a lot. When you get a sign, whatever it is, you know, maybe you have a dream about them. Some people will tell me, oh, I had this dream about my mom and she was talking to me and I was so happy. And then I realized, wait a second, you're dead. Well, how can you be talking to me? And at that moment, they like disappear and then they're distressed. But the idea is if they give you a sign, just hold on to the sign, whatever the sign is, focus on it. Turn it into a hologram in your mind. So you remember what that looked like when you saw your mom or smelled that perfume or saw that thing or heard the song that they love so much. Just, just lock it into some kind of a way of remembering it, like a hologram. And then using that hologram in front of you, say their name, ask them questions, when you hear an answer before you can ask the question, you'll know you've made a connection. That simple. Yep. But sounds, and then as you always remind me, um, don't judge the answers. Don't judge the answers and see, and then give them time to deliver it too. Right. I'm back to you, Lou. I, I interrupted you. Patience is the first thing you said. So have patience. So how do you construct a visual or uh, I mean I'm talking to Lou. Luana, how would you construct a memory or a visual? But they just take a picture from your head. So you just went and just grabbed a picture from my head that I would know of a sand dollar. Mm -hmm. And then what made me laugh is I'm like, oh yeah, the beach is open tomorrow. That's what made me, you know, but then I already forgot about it when I went to the beach until I saw the sand dollar. I'm like, oh yeah, my dad told me that last night. Right. He, you know, so it's like they're outside of time right and they can so people have talked to me about this for example a woman whose son had passed away she had a dream about him 
and in the dream, he, she was hearing the song, Stairway to Heaven. And when she told that to me, I said, well, that's an appropriate song for your son to play for you, isn't it? Because that's where he is, et cetera, et cetera. And then a few moments later, when we drove to a restaurant, this was uh, after a book talk I gave, uh, at the restaurant, she said, you're not gonna believe it. When I turned on the car, the song, Stairway to Heaven, was on the radio. I, I said, look, it's the most popular song in the history of rock and roll. So the odds of it playing are pretty high. But the odds of us having the conversation and then moments later experiencing it are right. different. Plus, if you think about it, how does that work? How would, because you know how songs are programmed on the radio, they do them in advance, you know, maybe months, maybe years. It's all part of a program that's typed in and it goes into the computer and then at such and such time. So it's not like they're on the flip side going, hmm, pull up cassette number five. You know, it's they already, but because they're outside of time, it's not hard. We talked about this. For the, you know, to put that idea in their mind. You know, the programmer, put it in for this time, two days from now, and then that'll be the moment when I tap my mom on the shoulder after she's talked to you. I mean, it's clever, it it's did. math. So what keeps coming, what they're showing me is that's the way, that's, their, that's the way that coincidences are made. That's how, that's the, there's a lot of effort that goes into those coincidences which are really not coincidences. I mean, I'm a fan of playing chess. And I remember thinking about Bobby Fischer and how they used to say he could think, I don't know what, it was something insane, like 37 moves in advance. That's, that's crazy. That's a kind of, sorry? That is crazy. But it's that, that's the math we're talking about. If you do this, that happens. And if that happens, then this happens. And if I keep working that out, I will get to the answer. So. Little enough about me. Who's here that needs to chat with us? Oh. Okay. Our pilot. Amelia <laughs> Earhart. Very yeah. good. Sorry. Do you know why? No. All right. I do. Amelia. It was just funny to me because I couldn't think of her name. And she's like, I'm the pilot. I'm like, I know you're the pilot. <laughs> I'm, I'm so sorry. Are you sure she didn't say, I'm the freaking pilot? She didn't have to. She didn't have to. So beautiful. For, okay, describe her for me, please. How does she look? What's she wearing? She has this like soft hair. Right now, she's just wearing. Well, that's the one. Hold on. She always shows up like in writing pants. Like what she would wear, you know. Yeah, I, like in a flight. Yeah, right. it's comfortable. That's how she shows it to me. With it. She always has a scarf on. And um, and there's something with glasses on her head, like glasses on her, the top of her head. Oh, like goggles. Yeah. Goggles. Like goggles. Yeah. And then wow. she... And she always has just, she has the most beautiful skin. She never wears anything. She just looks stunning. So, Amelia, today is a day that is, that people think of you. Do you want to put it in Jennifer's mind why today is particularly an unusual day in your... Normally I would say birthday, but it has to do with something she accomplished. Okay, you're giving me a freaking chill. Cut that out. Yeah. Okay. So do you want to show it to? She's showing me just the streets crowding, like her accomplishing. Again, it feels like it's in New York, but I'm not sure where it is. Okay. Very good. Um, I'll tell you in a second. I want to ask you about that street crowding event based on today. Today was an event that you did that's famous. I'll give you the time, it was 88 years ago today. Um, and let's just talk about that journey. I mean, eventually you get to a point where you're standing in front of millions of people, hundreds of thousands of people in New York City and hearing that sound that few humans have ever heard. 
she says it was a publicity thing. Like it was a big publicity thing. And she's saying Put the guy Putnam. Yeah. Or the guy, whatever. Her husband. Okay. Her husband. Her, her partner. <laughs> her partner. Her amazing soulmate, she says. Amazing uh, soulmate. Sweet. Oh, she thinks it's funny that I always go into a British accent. She's not. <laughs> yeah. She, neither one of them. But. Uh, no, uh, I, I think it has to be the person that she loved as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, the the uh, or the love of his life, the painter. Painter. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Um, so, but um, for a couple of questions. Why not, Amelia? We're so honored to have you here, and we're so happy to talk to you. And, and listen, I was um, I submitted a documentary to a a thing some work that I had done, and I don't know if it's gonna turn into something, it might, we've always talked about this. Um, and I'm also trying to decide whether to pitch, uh, you know, the, the scripted version of your story, which whatever, that's the future. You always encourage me. But I wanna ask you a little bit about this flight that occurred 88 years ago today. At some point, did you lose hope? Yes. In this flight, yes. Three different times, she says. Three different times. And what happened? What happened in the flight that weather, was so... Weather, she said. There uh -huh. was some weather. And she was, she's showing me so fatigued and sick. Like, it, it was almost like she was sick. Okay. And then she couldn't see. There was something about her not being able to see. Okay. These are all absolutely accurate. Because 88 years ago today, she flew solo across the, across the Atlantic. This was five years after she had flown in the back of the plane. This is the first time she flew and the first woman pilot ever to fly solo and make it. And at some point she gave up during the journey, according to her book on the topic, 20 hours, 40 minutes, which she helped, which George helped her write. But it was the story, uh, well, I think it was the second book. I'm sorry, that might've been referred to the first book, but anyway. No, it's okay though. She got up into the clouds and the plane's instruments failed. Yeah. She was trying to fly above a certain height. They all froze. Then she came down and the engine caught on fire. And then she couldn't see and she was going and bouncing around. And at some point, according to the, the book that she wrote on the topic, she decided to put the plane down in the water. Like come out of the clouds and hope that once she landed in the water, someone would find her. But when she came out of the clouds, show. Show Jennifer, what did you see when you came out of the clouds? She said she saw something that was like, so I'm getting, she saw new, She saw the destination. Ireland. Well, she I thought she was going to France, but she came out and there was a-, a oh, no, but she saw some, she saw land. I'm she seeing, saw land, that's what I was gonna say. And she came down and landed in this farmer's yeah. property. Okay. So ask her what was that like when you got out of the plane and this guy came over to you do you remember what he said <laughs> i don't know it almost sounds like thank you for not ruining my chickens or my pigs or something <laughs> thanks for not killing my cows he said he was listening on the radio oh okay it's very possible it's very possible. You know, the way that the story was told was more apocryphal. He came out and thought it was a man and yeah. yelled at him. And yeah. then, of course, that became... Well, that's what she showed me was he, he's yelling at her, but he's like, thank you for not, you know. Yeah, like, what are you doing? And then when she took off her hat, he recognized, oh, my God, that's a woman. And that's yeah. Amelia Earhart. Um, you know... We've talked to you about your journey. He says that they spiced that up a little bit. And uh, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Of course, it totally makes sense. I didn't know that, but that's what Yeah, because Hilton Rayleigh, who was like the publicity guy, he showed up to meet her and then he arranged for all the newsreels and she called George Putnam, you know, and all that other stuff. And yes, showbiz, it was a little bit of that. But here we are talking to the actual pilot who actually flew that plane 88 years ago. And after that ride, they brought her back to New York and she had a ticker tape parade. 
Yeah, that's what I saw when I was in New York, so I couldn't, yeah, I didn't know. Yeah. No, well, that's why I'm here, to sort of break it down. But a couple of things, Amelia. The Equal Rights Amendment, it's something that you helped craft and you fought for and argued for. Um, apparently, all this, no, most of this. You showed me Hoover. Yeah, that's right. She was with me. President. Hold on. She's the one that ran the White House, his wife. His wife. Okay, that makes sense. And she had a fondness for her, and she pushed things to get through. Oh, and Hoover met with her, and he was the one who announced and sort of, you know, helped be part of this Equal Rights Amendment, which just, I think, in the past year, finally, Virginia passed it, but they changed the laws so that it didn't mean it was law. Even though a majority of the states have passed that, it's no longer able to become law, equal rights. So just want to honor you for that, for that part of your journey. And what else you want to say, Amelia? What else? You're here. To put you in my, it's funny, because here I'm looking at you. I look away when I get information, just so people know. Yeah. Uh, but when... Okay, when you ask that question, she put you in my mind's eye. Um, tell Rich to turn in his script. <laughs> okay, Amelia, I'm sorry I haven't. We've only been doing this for, I don't know, seven, eight years, but. Um, I think I need to cast it first, honestly, Amelia. I think I we need- talk, She wants Scarlett Johansson. Did we ever say that before? Unfortunately, we have. <laughs> no, um, I'm, I'm joking. But yes, in Hacking the Afterlife, I specifically asked her, because I was as startled as anybody would be, you know, for her to tell me, who I've spent 30 years working on her story. So I know more than anybody I've ever met about her journey and her life. Right. I've met everybody that is involved in it. All of the controversy aside, she's got an amazing story. And it was a girlfriend of mine, Abby Adams, from, from high school, who after my first film, Limit Up, uh, said to me, you know, you should write a story about Amelia Earhart. And I paid attention to it. And I started working on it. And then she actually came out and helped me research it and craft it. And then we pitched it. I think to one or two people and Diane Keaton's company picked up the script and actually made the movie, but kicked me off it and hired somebody else. So it was like, gee, thanks. And I gave it up and then the, you know, kept pulling me back in. And then eventually Philip Noyce, the film director was going to direct my version of it, my screenplay. We talked about it. He, I'm sorry. He was going to produce the film that I was going to direct anyway. It's a long saga, but then he got involved with the Hillary Swank version and he hired me to work on that. And then I stayed on it when he left and Mira Nair made the film and it was a mishigas. It was a mishmash. We've talked about that. It doesn't tell her story. Unfortunately, you know, they spent $30 million not telling her story. Sorry? We weren't ready for it. She keeps showing me the hundredth, like a hundred. So oh I know. My gosh, that's 12 years. From now. But how old was she? How old is she right now? Uh, well, she's over 100. She's over 100. Based on, I mean, yeah. if she crossed over in 1944, then that's that. Yeah. 45. yeah. If she, 44. She was born, I think, in uh, 1900. It might have been 1897, but she would be older than that. But, but it is. This is the 88th anniversary of this second flight. So if you take off, if you uh, add five, whatever, 100 years might be in like six or seven years. So maybe, maybe, who knows? I'll be standing, you know, at the ceremony going, yeah, I'd like to thank the members of the Academy and Jennifer for winning this award for me. From the flip side. Anyway, that's a... Yeah. 
You are you are highly decorated over there. <laughs> so I appreciate it, Amelia. And I want to remind people that Jennifer and I generally don't talk about what's going to happen or we don't predict things. She might do that personally with people because she has a better sense of what the future is going to be. I try to keep our discussions in practical things that people can do. Right. Because the, the future that's, is... That's another thing, though, that people, and they showed me this earlier. Yes, I agree with you. The future is made to be changed. We're made to change our outcomes. I totally agree with you. Free will. You. We Free screwed will. up. But I think our loved ones also, when we ask about something or someone, they can give us like a premonition. They could just give us like a little blip of something that's going to happen. A taste. And also, it could be that I never make a film about Amelia, but because of this journey, this odd journey, I mean, I've had three different mediums reach out to me and say, you're going to make a film about Amelia. And maybe it's so that I work in this fashion so that we can reveal other things. And maybe I'll make the film on the flip side. I don't know. <laughs> No, I keep seeing Netflix. Okay. Well, I know those guys. Okay. That's very good. I appreciate Scarlett Johansson. If you're listening, we met at Philip Noyce's house. Come on, let's go make Amelia Earhart's story. You're, you'd be perfect for it. I just haven't figured out how to get you into that. Get into a room where we can talk about it. I mean, I met you, but you probably don't remember that either. Anyway. You played the piano. She does remember. I did. I did. Well. She does remember. Okay. That's funny. Um, all right. But Luana, enough about me. This is all about me, isn't it? But Luana, back to you, my dear. Who, now, do, who wants to kick Amelia out of the chair? Who wants to talk to us? Um, or does Amelia want to? It's fine. I just got, hold on one second. Um. They're talking a lot to our buddy. He loves to talk to Hira. Okay. Hira's dog, by the way, for those people. Have you talked to him about Amelia? Uh, yes, I have. I did yes. ask him if he'd be involved. We're talking about the Oscar winning screenwriter, Robert Town, whose dog, Hira, I used to walk. I walked for like three years. So Hira and I are closer than Robert and I. No, but Robert said he'd. He participated in our Amelia story. So that's probably why they're popping Robert into it, into my mind. Oh, really? Yeah. And he just, he's doing a, a series with Netflix. So they're probably referring to that as well. So yes, the answer is yes. If I can get Robert and Scarlett in a room, I can hide in the back while they go and make this story. And I just cheer everybody on. It's possible. I don't know. Right. Oh, you see, this is these are story conferences of the future. This will be the studio executives calling up Jennifer and saying, "Okay, everybody, let's get on this Zoom session together. We're going to ask some questions about." <laughs> okay. Well, you just have a different. I think there's a lot of there's a lot of people ready for it. I okay. think they're ready for it. I think there's a lot. Of, I think it would be. And they're just showing me Virginia, like with what you said earlier. I think that it, people weren't ready for it before, like they are now. Yeah, they could be. Listen, you know, I think we should tell this story that includes this information, includes the fact that you still exist, includes the fact that George still exists, includes the idea that we can communicate with them and ask them questions about their journey. Not so much about this format, but in storytelling ways, you know, right. you have... People like, um, uh, I'm thinking there's a Japanese, Akira Kurosawa did that where people were in a room talking to the camera and then you realize after the film is over, oh, they already died. They were talking to us from the flip side. You see, something like that. I think that could be a clever way to introduce the topic. I think that's pretty cool. I think that's amazing. I'm sure you've mentioned this before. No, but no I never have. Hira popped in a conversation the other day, talking to Robert. 
And so, Hira, is there anything you would like to impart to our friend? <laughs> He's like, tell him to listen to me. Hold on. Well, he, he missed. Oh, it. so much better. Hold on. He's actually seeing him now, and he's believing it more. Okay. Um, and is there any higher give us or give people tuning in because this is confusing. Animals are important too, is the first. Okay. Thing. But underlining that, how do you communicate with us? Just she just shows me just putting thoughts into our heads. And for somebody out there who misses their pet, their animal, well, desperately. So he, he shows me, like in dreams, like in the dream state, nobody talks like this. There's nobody, if you've ever been in, you know, if you ever remember your dreams, they're not talking. They're projecting their thoughts. And that's how it works with me. They're projecting their thoughts. They're giving me feelings, emotions. You know, some people just get a knowing. Some people get a scent, a smell. Some people get pictures, like a movie that passes through. I happen to have all of it. I get all that information, but it's not, doesn't, there's no hierarchy. It just means I have to understand more. It would actually be easier just to have a knowing, but it's just not how I work. Yeah. Um, but in terms of Hira, and thank you, that's what I was asking. But in terms of Hira passing along or any animal that you know, Hira, some, somebody out here, somebody here is suffering and missing their pet. How, would they be able to ask the pet to communicate? <laughs> Put a little food down. <laughs> <laughs> a treat. That a would treat be so funny. I've never even like. Is he serious or is he just saying metaphorically? Because then you're thinking about him. It's like saving a seat. It's like calling their name. Yeah, it's like saving a seat at the table. That's brilliant. What yeah. about going out to a park, their favorite park? let's say, where they used to run and romp. That's a great, yeah, you don't have to, you just show me, you don't have to pick up the poop anymore. You just <laughs> have to go to the park. That's really, uh, that's a, yes, so that's awesome. Going to the, the location where you used to hang out with your loved one uh, or your pet. Did I freeze? Am I freezing? Here. Okay, sorry about that. So many yeah. people in this apartment, in this room, actually, doing Wi-Fi. It freezes. So, so the people want to know, Jennifer, besides the animal question, which I think we've answered, and besides talking to our celebrity friend, Amelia, thank you very much for showing up, what's something that we can tell them about connecting to loved ones who passed away, even within this pandemic, you know, 100,000 people have passed away suddenly that we're here. The question yeah. isn't to go through all of them, but is there something Luana can give us in terms of consolation or helping us understand the process? I know it doesn't help, but know that they're okay. Know that they, they realize how sad people are here, but they're okay. They are so loved over there on the other side. And if you think about it, all you want for anybody that passes away is to be met with love and to be met with a huge team of people that, you know, maybe they knew or maybe they didn't know. But from what I've experienced in talking to them, you and I both, when they go over, they, and they, there's so much healing that occurs instantaneously. And there's so much knowledge that comes through right away. Um, where they're like, oh, that's why I'm here, or that's what happened. You know, some people, and I was just reminded, some people it takes a little bit more time to get them to know that they're gone. Um, but there's always a soft landing on the other side. So if there's, thank you. So when they're showing me this, just know that you're hurting, but know that they're loved and know that they are well taken care of. Um, regardless of what faith or whatever they believe in. Um, and for us, if we can have a little bit, if we can think about that and ask them to give us signs and ask them to talk to us or whatever, 
I mean, hold on. They just showed me like, put, you know, put, if it's your mom and she has perfume, spray some perfume, you know? Cause what it does is it triggers, all, like smells trigger and music triggers all the senses of all the times that you've seen them like that, or you've been with them during those songs or times, or it's just whatever, whatever you can do to keep their memory, which is them, still alive. You know, and we've heard this often, that idea of toasting them or celebrating them as if they were in the room to, you know, at a dinner party or a restaurant or you go to the movies, picture them sitting next to you and have that conversation. Because even if it's imaginary, even if it's you making up the fact that they're there, you have the effect, the emotional effect on your body of feeling as if they're there. And based on 10 years of research and our research together, they are there. <laughs> and they want to let you know they're okay. Sometimes it takes a while for them, just like you were saying, to adjust to, I mean, especially if somebody, we were talking to Carl Sagan. Go ahead. I said it takes us a lot longer to adjust than it does them. Yeah. We were talking to Carl Sagan about his atheism and his disbelief in the flip side. And I asked him, so how long did it take you to realize you were in the afterlife? We've asked this question many times. And, you know, usually it's an incident. But he said it took him a long time. He said he spent a lot of time walking by himself. He wasn't aware that there were other frequencies around him because it's what he believed. And he believed right. it so strongly, he didn't see them right. until an incident happened. Because then I asked, what was the incident? And he said something very unusual and strange, and it's in Backstage Pass, but he said, Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> and I remember we have like, what? She's, and Jennifer, I remember you saying, she's still alive, isn't she? And he said, Carl Sagan said, that's what happened. I saw her higher self walking right. along and she came up to me and took my hand. And he said to her, You're, and then they looked down at herself down on the planet. And he said, but you're here as well as there. And she went, I know. And that was the moment that he realized he was somewhere else. It took yeah. him a long time, he said. Yes. So at least I don't know what long means. You know, it meant something to him. Not billions and billions of years, but it did take a certain amount of time for Carl to understand that transition. But that idea of understanding things on the flip side, how things work, mathematics, advanced mathematics and physics and quantum physics. And what I love about our work is I come up with some silly question to ask scientists, and then I ask you, can we talk to fill in the blank? Like I say that, who comes to mind? What scientists come to mind? Um, the guy in the wheelchair came to mind. So, The guy in the wheelchair has wheeled in here a number of times, and then he gets out of the wheelchair and answers our questions. So Luana, do you have any question I should ask Stephen Hawking about the nature of the universe? The parallel universes. Parallel. Like, so parallel. you've heard this, maybe you heard this thing in the news the other day that somebody in NASA yeah. thought, yeah. In, a lot, well, in Antarctica? Yeah, and listen, I've done the research. And, as, and that's why I thought of Carl Sagan, because he said, extraordinary <laughs> claims requires extraordinary evidence. And actually, if you read the results, which I've done, it doesn't say that there's a parallel universe moving backwards. It doesn't say that at all. It says that there's data that they can't understand, which is what we deal with every freaking day. So today, most people haven't seen it, but Forbes and other magazines have come out and said, NASA never said that, that the data doesn't show that, that it shows that we don't know what's going on. That's all it shows. It doesn't show a parallel universe moving backwards. And as I've pointed out. And does, it Luana, show, does it show a possibility? Well, it shows the possibility of other 
universes, we've heard this many times. We right, talk yeah. to people who say that they existed in other realms and they're coming here to answer our questions. That exists. So but the idea of an exact go ahead. So Amelia Earhart showed me being here and being somewhere else at the same time when she was flying a rocket at another place. She was flying an airplane here. It was almost like the evolution of planes and she was in different places. Experiencing in different realms at the same time. We've talked to people who have or are currently living on the planet and concurrently experience a lifetime elsewhere, yeah. another planet, but not identical not yeah. parallel and not the same but moving backwards which he, is he i'm sorry because it's just language it is just language but when you get God, into this parallel God, going backwards God gene or whatever it is or the what is it called the what I'm the just, God, the, oh the god gene yeah this i don't know idea well this idea that when you when you study uh, quantum physics, you're going to find God somewhere in there. But I think it's getting caught up in syntax. What we've heard consistently. It's the black, it's the black, it's the black holes. And black it's holes, we've talked about that. It's something connected to our, our electric magnetic field. Consciousness, our electromagnetic field, consciousness as well. I mean, I'm putting those two words together, but that's what we've learned. He just showed me taking off the suit, like the body suit, you know, that's what stays, but everything else goes and is connected. So I'm sorry. So this is Mr. Hawking who's showing us that example. Yeah. Very good. So the body suit falls away. The energy returns home. Is that correct? It's funny. He's like, thank God. No pun intended. Yeah, well, in his case, well, we well, talked to him about his choice. Right. I mean, that he chose a lifetime that would have introspective introspection but the energy people report that it goes back home so Stephen what is home is it a place is it a state of mind is it a physical spot somewhere in another realm All the molecules in the universe? Huh. Um, it's all the connections we have to, he's just shown me everything, plants, the sea, the, everything that we're, like we're connected to absolutely everything. And all we're supposed to do is bring things up <laughs> without it being a hierarchy. Okay, I just want to clarify. I answered, I asked the question, where's home? And instead of addressing a place, there is no he, place. There is no place. What he, what he pointed to was a, like a state of mind, but a state of existence, which is that everything is connected energetically. That's Jennifer's way for Only saying, time I, ever I need a nose that. job talk to you no <laughs> you hit it on the mark that's what they show me every time I, it's only within this class it's the only isn't it interesting well my dad and my cat <laughs> well this my is dad, what yeah, even well, your back. dad your dad shared with us for the audience that hasn't read backstage pass to the flip side one a classroom that he went took us to it was like uh, unbelievable in, in quantum right. physics and he explained it and described it, and he, he took you there physically. You've had the journey of going to this classroom, and I was there hanging on for dear life. And we got there, and then I asked impertinent questions, you know, to the teacher, to students, anybody that's there. And it was fascinating because their answers are right in line with what other people have said, but what Stephen Hawking has said, what other scientists have said, which is that we're all connected, we, we tend to think in terms of here, space, but the, over there, they're still connected to us. Those people who've dropped out of the body suits, animals, trees, everything is connected. In all the dimensions. And all the dimensions throughout different universes. Now. The one thing that, the one thing that stays constant is our planet. Okay. 
So like all the dimensions, I believe, reside on Earth. Like not, they reside, I'm so sorry. In our universe. In our universe. But I'm just saying that all the dimensions, what we're, okay, hold on a second. He does this. All the dimensions can affect, oh, because it's different time periods. Fudge. Well, that, don't get caught up in the time. You're outside of time. No, we are outside of time, but that's what I'm saying. He's saying that all the dimensions affect this earth. Okay, and affects, affect us. All right, so I'm just no, trying to unpack that. Okay, just real fast. I'll share with you what I, okay, so I, I asked the question, is it just our, is it just this dimension that's hurting the earth? And he said, no, it's all the dimensions hurting the earth, but he's also showing me that all the dimensions are different time periods. Affecting the earth, but let me, let me clarify that for a second. I was talking to a guide about about how we observe our previous lifetimes, whether they're all simultaneous or linear. And he said, imagine a string, and along the string are each one of your lifetimes. And they go in order because you learn things. I learned this, I learned that, I learned more, but da da da. But when you turn it this way, you observe all the lifetimes simultaneously. All of them are there. You can see how my lifetime 10,000 years ago affected this one, that the thing I wanted to learn six lifetimes ago, I'm learning now. What Hawking has just said, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Stephen, is that all the universes all exist in that same way, so that they're all dimensional, and stuff that occurred in another dimension is affecting stuff that's occurring in this dimension. They're all a system. They're all connected. So is that correct? Yes, because if our lifetimes are not just here, then all the dimensions of all the time periods that we exist in, even elsewhere, yes, will be affecting her. He also said something really interesting. I just want to repeat. It's in Backstage Pass, the flip side three. He said, imagine each lifetime as a, well, I'll pick something up, uh, as a floppy disk. Okay. And that, there's, there's your disk. And inside the disk is all the data and all the information of an event. And when you want to access an event, my birth, Stephen Hawking's birth, Jesus Christ's birth, Christopher Columbus, Amelia Earhart, we access the time frame, which is that data. And within that little hologram, it, it has everything. But we can access just one specific thing. Amelia looking to you like she's about... 30 years old, 35, something like that. That's a specific date and time and whatever. But she has access to everything that's happened to her, previous lifetimes, what's going on, my conversations with you. But we're tapping into this slice of time. And this is what Hawking had said, that each slice of time contains all the information you need to know about any particular event. Is that correct, sir? I love when I ask a question that I, you know, he could say no. You're goofy. No, he said that was a great way of putting it. Oh, well, thank you, sir. I Did he put- say it with an English accent? Well, that was a great way of putting it. No, that was a uh, But I saw too, because somebody else told us, which I don't remember, of course, um, is that. Oh, and just for, again, for the listeners, the reason why I don't remember is because I do my work and I'm in the theta delta state. Why I'm doing my work. Yeah. If you've ever talked to anybody that's asleep, they don't remember. That's what right. happens to me all day long when I'm awake doing this work. That's why I ask her for lottery numbers every time. So, <laughs> you, did, you did win. I did win. She gave me lottery numbers. I won. A dollar. A dollar. And then I heard, not very specific, were we? No. Um, but so each lifetime, we're like passing the baton to each other and to our soul group to get it better, to get whatever we're supposed to learn, however we're supposed to learn it. So to be, I don't know, almost was passing like... Passing the baton, that's a brilliant image. Yeah, like we're trying to outdo ourselves in every dimension. And also... You know, our journey is difficult. You got to go around the track. You got to let it all out. You got to run. You got to look at everybody around you. And then you have to time it just right. Just like that baton. The person that hurt the witches. Remember? Yes. For people who aren't aware, I will recount that when Jennifer was accessing past lifetimes. Just asked. I'm like, are you sure I was that person? (laughs) Well, she remembered being somebody who tortured witches. 
So and it was so partially, you know, a lifetime now where you can access information on the flip side. You're not a witch, but you are. I'm a good witch. You're a good witch. Okay, very good. Interesting. We also spoke to Joan of Arc in Backstage Pass and because we talked to her about that and why she got burned at the stake and why. And it was because she was she was like you. She could see and hear a clairaudient and et cetera, et cetera. And that, they didn't like that. And she was supposed to denounce, you know, and of course they assigned it all to Christ and et cetera. But just like Amelia, Joan is okay. You know, right. she's reincarnated many, many times. Amelia says she hasn't, she's still recovering, but. Well, it's not that she hasn't, this part of her hasn't. They always remain in touch with their. That's right. Well, according to the research, two thirds of our whoever we are is always back home on the flip side. Right. And we only bring about a third. But it's, and this is important to note, it's not as if one person replaces the other one in, in reincarnation, like the right. baton. That's what it's, you have Because yeah. we're, we're only bringing a third of our consciousness. So what you're bringing is a third of all of our lifetimes, like the pizza that's back there, we're bringing a slice which has pepperoni and mushroom and onion, everything on it. And in this lifetime, we might just focus on the onion, focus on the mushroom. But when we end here, as Hawking said, the, the body dissipates and the energy goes back home. It brings every spice that we took well, during the lifetime. So when you get back to this pizza and gets put together again, now the pizza's got more flavors. You like that? Yes, it does. <laughs> you probably haven't had lunch either. I didn't have lunch. I didn't have lunch. Okay. <laughs> but it still made me hungry. <laughs> That's the, the lesson in life. Pay attention to your pizza, said the guy with the martini sign over his head. And always enjoy your cappuccino. How long do I have you for, my dear? Just a couple of minutes. I have oh, to. Right. Any other life puzzles we should solve? Luana? Anybody else that needs to come forward in our last minute? Okay, your mother, Auntie. Auntie, Auntie. Hi, Auntie. Hi, Mom. Oh, hold on. She says, don't worry about what's happening in the other the other room or whatever they're doing. I know that you told me that they've done construction. Yeah, in the uh, apartment. Anthony, let, let me get some, let me just dive in with you real quickly. Showing me the air stuff. One of your son, one of your sons sent me something of yours. You want to show Jennifer? Well, I saw you playing the guitar, but I know she played the piano. And there's something that you're going to publish if you haven't already. He sent me, he sent me a box of photographs. Okay. Yeah. Family okay. pictures that I haven't seen ever, or, you know, that were in the closet in the closet. And so. Because you're going to hang one of them. Okay. I just saw a picture of you at like 16. It's like so gorgeous and beautiful. Oh, she was here earlier because I was getting confused with 16 with Amelia Earhart. That's oh. interesting. Oh, she kept okay. Well, mom had red hair, so maybe she was meeting with Amelia's. I don't know, but I thought it was Amelia, and then, but yeah, I mean, well, both, whatever. We, both of them at the same time. We can talk bo to both of them, and we love both of them. Mom, yeah. I love you a little bit more. I know you. Um, anything you want to say to your kids or your relatives? <laughs> really? She says, this isn't war. You guys will be fine. You just, she just this isn't war. Wow, that's brilliant. Like, this isn't war. She's For like, people she, who, oh, go ahead. It's like sucking on baby bottles. Like, we just need to suck it up a little bit and help each other out. Help each other out. For those who want to know who we're talking about, go to anthy, A N T H Y, martini.com. 10 years ago, I posted a bunch of uh, videos of my mom playing the piano in our living room. And you can listen to mom at work. So there you go. Anthony, 
We love that. Suck it up. <laughs> so I'm like, and then I'm like, are you, are you sure you want me to say that? And she goes, yes. <laughs> You're not being drafted. It's not. That's right. She yeah. went through a war. The only food shortage is in our heads. Very interesting because they it, they lived through World War II. She suffered through it. Her father was the Assistant Secretary of Navy, Office of Naval Intelligence, who was aware that Amelia had been captured. I find that out later on. She's, and she's not, she's also not, she's not saying that we shouldn't have military, you know, she's not saying anything like that, but she's just saying this isn't war. She's saying it's not as difficult as we imagine. Yeah, a lot of people are dying and that's terrible. And that's a tragedy. But it's not as hard as people are really, it's not like going to war. Going to war the way they did. Yeah, like my grandmother had to work, she had to weld plant, she had to weld ships. She was Amazing. a welder. Amazing. But, yeah. and all of them, and they lost friends, and you know, they, all of their friends. We've talked to a few of them, we've talked to a number of them. So, thank you, Anthony, for reminding us perspective. Just have some perspective about tragedy. Look, everyone's okay on the flip side, no matter what happens. That's what they wanted to, to hear. That's, a, that's what they want to say. Yes. All right, well, let's thank everybody. Let's thank Jennifer. Oops, I don't know where you are. There you are. <laughs> you want to thank Jennifer? You want to thank Anthe? I want to thank Amelia Earhart, Stephen Hawking, Carl yeah. Sagan. Yes. I referenced you. I didn't really ask any questions, but that's okay. I know that. Um, well, the music class, all the music people got in trouble for taking over last time. <laughs> <laughs> they got in trouble. Like, so Spanked. that's like that's why nobody besides your mom I take that back she's like wait I'm wait yeah she is a musician well Lou you're in charge this is your clipboard this is your class we're just here to help you thank you, thank you Dad. go through the list and, Hira. And, Hira. and Hira let's not forget Hira Lou is there anything anybody you want me to look up or think about for our next class I've never asked that before but well, I keep feeling it's the director. You're going to know somebody that knows. Well, you do know somebody that knows. The oh, class. that film director. OK. Let's just say that if it comes through uh, right. that. So you and I, somebody comes up to us and says, gee, I really wish I'd talked to her. I don't like I say, I didn't know her. And I don't know people who okay, knew her that, that closely. Know her. Yes, we will talk to yeah. her. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll do the research. If Luana lets her in, uh, that's a silly way to put it, but if yeah. she put the idea in my head, I'll be happy to do that. Okay. Happy to do it. Okay, we love you. Love you. We'll catch you on the flip side. <laughs> <laughs> okay.